<clears throat> Hello, uh, we'll talk now about uh, an important um, artist and architect, uh, an Italian uh, architect, Baltasare Peruzzi, who lived between 1481 and 1536. So he died at uh, 55. He could have lived longer, but at that time architects didn't live so long as they live now. Today there are many, I mean, these days there are many architects who uh, live over 90. Uh, this is uh, an engraving of, uh, of, you know, showing him. Um, I used to know the name of this um, etcher or engraver, but I forgot it. But I still admire the, the graphic representation of Peruzzi. Uh, but usually these, um, these uh, engravers took liberties in order to portray, uh, you know, famous artists and architects. So, you know, they are not photographs. Sometimes they are idealized portraits. But it might be that um, because it is, a good, uh, it's a, it is a good engraving and uh, it might be that indeed the Peruzzi look kind of like, like what we look at here. So, Baldassare Tommaso Peruzzi, born on the 7th of March, and he died on the 6th of January. And that's the reason we talk about him today, because today is the 6th of January, but not 1536 when he died, but 2023. He was an Italian architect and painter born in a small town near Siena, in Ancaiano Frazione of Sovicile, and died in Rome. He worked for many years with Bramante, Raphael, and later Sangallo during the erection of, of the new St. Peter's. Well, what a group of people, no? Bramante, Raphael, Sangallo, and Baldassare Peruzzi. He returned to his native Siena after the sack of Rome in 1527, where he was employed as architect to the Republic. For the Sienese, he built new fortifications for the city and designed, though did not build a remarkable dam on the Bruna River near Giuncarico. He seems to have moved back to Rome permanently by 1535. He died there the following year and was buried in the rotunda of the Pantheon near Raphael. My God, my God. I mean, you know, to, to be buried in the rotunda of the Pantheon near Raphael, this shows clearly how admired, how respected, how loved Baltazare Peruzzi was. So he died in 1536, almost 500 years ago. Portrait, portrait of Baltazare Peruzzi, illustratio from La Vite by Giorgio Vasari. Vasari, uh, you know, again, uh, the portraits are as they are. The previous one for me is more interesting. But anyway, this is what when was in 1568. So he already died, you know, with almost 30 years earlier or so, a little more than 30 years. But this was from the Levite by Giorgio Vasari. And this is a, another portrait of Baldassare Peruzzi. Okay some drawings of this artist architect um, you know perspectival drawings what amazes me is that the great andrea palladio i never saw a work a perspectival drawing by andrea palladio and palladio lived later than peruzzi but look here he he was a you know almost a master of of, of perspective linear perspective it's drawn uh, scientifically almost, uh, you know, it, it shows clearly that, that, you know, perspective, linear perspective, manual perspective was already developed and it was, uh, you know, discovered uh, 100, uh, 150 years earlier by Piero della Francesca and by uh, Brunelleschi and in 15 whatever, uh, when Peruzzi did his drawing, uh, perspective was, uh, you know, known, but not Andrea Palladio, strangely. He built the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the theater where he uh, employed, uh, uh, you know, a false uh, perspective in terms of building it, 
but uh, uh, drawing uh, done in perspectival mode, I didn't see. I only see Euclidean. This is very interesting because we are talking about Andrea Palladio, now the paradigmatic architect, European architect, the, the one and only, Andrea Palladio. And he only used uh, bidimensional drawings, Euclidean drawings, although perspective was already employed and discovered uh, much earlier. And we see here Peruzzi using it, uh, you know, copiously, I feel like saying. But Palladio didn't care. He was still loyal to Euclid and Euclidean two-dimensional representations. Very interesting, uh, I would say. Uh, you know, all those masters of the time drew impeccably. You know, it's hard to it's hard to differentiate actually between them. And you can imagine if this man was buried near Raphael in the Pantheon. You know, he worked with Bramante, Raphael, and Sangalo for uh, you know. I mean, you know, these are these were some of the greatest artists of the Renaissance, and uh, uh, it shows. I mean, you know, these were. Uh, uh, you know, men of great skill and great sensitivity. And of course, they were artists. They were not homo economicus. They were not businessmen. Even though some might say, of course, some people, they, they, they had knowledge about money and about the human affairs. Maybe they did. But we contemplate now not their calculations, not their salaries, not their, not their accumulations of wealth, we admire their work, and their work is uh, belongs to art. Clearly, Baltazar Peruzzi. So uh, I guess I show too many uh, graphic works, uh, but I will show some buildings by him as well. This is not a long presentation. It's a small homage done to this uh, architect who should be remembered and should be known, Baltazar Peruzzi. Who had a chance which we do not have? Because Baltazar Peruzzi, like the artists of his time and architects and so on, they, they were united through a shared symbolic order, the kind religion provided. We do not have that. We are free, but we are uh, ruthless. We, are, we, are, we pay the price for our freedom. They still had, at that time, that shared symbolic order that the religion provided. And all the artworks that we looked at were inspired by that, um, you know, a shared symbolic order. He loved perspective, obviously, but he loved beauty also in whatever forms. Peruzzi, some paintings, because he was a painter as well. Look at this. Not the dance of Henri Matisse, but uh, dance nevertheless. Baltazar Peruzzi. Baltazar Peruzzi. Peruzzi again. Peruzzi the architect, Peruzzi the artist. Now architecture. Let's see, Villa Farnesiana, Rome. This villa was constructed by Baltasare Peruzzi between 1508 and 1511, in commission by Agostino Chigi. Yeah, 
It is true. At that time, they didn't build, uh, you know, social housing, and this is not something that I admire. You know, they built for uh, rich aristocrats, for noblemen, uh, but sometimes they build like uh, Brunelleschi, you know, uh, Ospedale degli Innocenti, uh, hospital for for children. So you know, social concerns and uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, works animated by empathy still happened. But most of the time, of course, the works were done for those who could afford, uh, afford them. Villa Farnesiana, Peruzzi. Large spaces. I mean, the loggia is large. All the look, look at the door here. You know, I mean, you know, this is, this is a giant room. Even these are large rooms. And of course, art, art, and also the trompe l'oeil is employed. Something we don't do any longer. We only build white walls. You know, even the buildings by Zaha Hadid are are, are are excessively white. You know, but at that time, they they maybe they had some kind of a horror vacui, because you see, they covered every square inch of the room of the building with paintings with false perspectives you know here you see you think that this this is open it's not it's a flat wall and with this uh, trompe l'oeil that um, it creates uh, the illusion of the space extending outside beyond the limits the actual physical limits of the building Towards the outside, the building is, uh, you know, uh, straightforward and, uh, uh, you know, uh, limiting. But inside, because of the art, we see the desire to extend beyond the physical limits. And uh, maybe this is the role of art to, to, to help us transgress limits in general. And even to transgress, you know, as the ultimate... Uh, uh, aspiration test, but that's a different story uh, altogether. But in a way, you try to you you, you try to uh, move beyond the limits through um, you know excellence in any field you work. You try to conquer time. You try to you know to to uh, to move towards the absolute, to, towards the infinite, and the artist has his means. Other disciplines have their means, not less noble, but art does have this uh, capacity to transgress death through beauty. Now, of course, in such works, the artist was employed by the architect, sometimes the architect was also the artist. But in rare cases, in general, there were artists, there were teams of artists that worked together with the architect to create a whole work of art. And look at that ceiling, you know? <laughs> I mean, compare it with the flat white ceilings of modernity. It's, and what is the ceiling? Is the transition between the room and the sky. And, you know, moving beyond the measurable, you would say, or the physical, the gods. You know, it's, 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 it's between the earth and the sky, between uh, uh, the measurableness of, of, of the terrestrial and the immeasurableness of the celestial. And as such, the ceiling is very, very important because, you know, it, it, it connects you with the beyond. Raphael Loggia, the Psyche, Psyche and the pen, Pendentis, so these were done by Raphael in the same building. Raphael, who died also young, like uh, Vincent van Gogh, except, except that he didn't commit suicide. Um, uh, apparently, well, someone maybe malicious or envious said that Raphael died because of romantic uh, exhaustions. I don't know. 
but he was one, one of the greatest uh, artists of all time. And uh, he deserved to be buried together with Peruzzi in the Pantheon in Rome. Sala delle prospettive, meaning of the perspective. Here it is, look at here, you know. You say, well, I'll gladly go to the loggia. Well, you can't because this is a wall. You'll hit a wall, but, but it is painted in this way so you can see in the distance what you would see if there was no wall. Trompe l'oeil. Can you imagine how much work and how much skill went into, do, into doing this? I mean, look at the minuteness of the representation here, which is painted. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. Someone worked here very, very hard in order to achieve this on a, you know, on a blunt wall. Peruzzi. Baltazar Peruzzi. Look at the people staring at the wall. But it's not just a wall, you know. It's a painted wall, and it's a painted wall which, which tries to give you the illusion that it is not there, that you can see through the building. So you see, we don't need necessarily glass walls. We don't need necessarily glass houses. We could have houses with, uh, without glass, actually, but we can employ the art of, of uh, trompe l'oeil to create what Peruzzi created and the artists that he worked with. This is the, you know, the room, the vast room of uh, perspectives. Let's see how it was called in Italian. Sala delle prospe prospettive. Sala delle prospettive by uh, Peruzzi and, uh, and the artists who, who uh, worked with him. Bravo to them. Palazzo Massimo alla Colonna. This is a very interesting work. The Palazzo Massimo alla Colone, uh, alle Colone is a Renaissance palace in Rome, Italy. The palace was designed by Baltasare Peruzzi in 1532, 1536, uh, on a site of three contiguous palaces owned by the old Roman Pas Massimo family and built after Arson destroyed the earlier structures during the sack of Rome, 1527. In addition, the curved facade, you see, is a fascinating building, was dictated by foundations built upon the stands for the stadium, the Odeon of the Emperor Domitian. Domitian, Domitian. It, fronts, uh, it fronts the now busy Corso Vittorie Emanuele II, a few hundred yards from the front of the church of Sant'Andrea della Valle. This is the building. And it is a, a very interesting building because of the curvature. You know, if there wasn't that curvature at the top, you would almost say that it's a flat building, but it's not. It has a certain level of, of modernity. Manner is modernity somehow. A very interesting building by Baltasare Peruzzi. And we are going to see the plan as well. Even the windows are interesting, you know, like uh, look those two levels with uh, those uh, small windows. Uh, really, this is almost a modern building, you know, half of it at least would have pleased probably uh, other floors. And look at the plan and the section. So this building is in Rome by Baltasar Peruzzi. But don't look please at the, at the height of the ceiling of this room because it would, it would uh, intimidate us. You know, we, we do not build rooms uh, so with such tall ceilings unless of course we are the clients of Richard Meyer or I don't know who. You know, most of the time we live in rooms <laughs> You know, and in spaces kind of like this, <laughs> at best, but not like this. This is probably for a servant or who knows what, and this is for the 
no, 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 the aristocrat, the nobleman. So this is, it's interesting the plan because actually, you know, the limit of the, of the building is here on this wall, but it extends a little bit right here on the facade. So you, you have the feeling that it's much wider. It's not much, but wider and almost symmetrical. But in reality, the building ends on the limit of this wall. So it is a difficult site. Uh, it would have been a difficult site for any architect, but I think Baltasar Peruzzi uh, built an interesting and convincing building here. And the courtyard, uh, what can we say? It's, uh, uh, you know, I mean, just imagine being in this uh, loggia, you know, again with this, uh, um, you know, uh, very tall ceiling. And he, you know, again, this kind of building was not built for proletarians, was not built, was built for, um, you know, uh, for the very few. And uh, at the time, uh, you know, uh, uh, it was a different conception about space, about dimensions. They would not have lived in, in, in rooms, uh, you know, two meters, uh, 40 centimeters uh, tall where all the doors are two meters and 10 centimeters tall, uh, like, like uh, often happens in our time. Peruzzi, Baltasare Peruzzi. I love these old photographs, romantic as they are. And look at these columns here, you know, they are glorious with the arithmicity in a way, you know, this, um, just in themselves, somehow um, are uh, uh, very convincing architecturally, and also you know the photographer was induced by by them. That's it. So he died on the sixth of uh, January, and that's that was the reason we talked about Baltasar Peruzzi today. Thank you.